Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, gosh, what a pleasure to be here. And um, one of the things that, uh, well, first of all, we had a lovely chat on Zoom, which is actually militates against the very nature of the medium. Because yeah. <laughs> Zoom is meant to be like diabolically disengaging. And actually, I thought, oh, this is a great person. And I really enjoyed our chat. And then it was just so wonderful to see you today in person and to talk. And we covered all the key things between ranging from art to religion to um, personal anxieties. So it, we really we ran the full arc. Very um, high on personal anxiety. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. Um, and um, but I, you know, it's also great to be at such a wonderful gallery, and I love the design of this, and I think it's so um, sympathetic to the works, and I think it's so uh, it's such a beautiful thing. Not that not only that you have a wonderful professional partnership, but you also have a place to show your work in New York, which which really accentuates the kind of phenomenological experience that I have of going through your work, yes. which is that you enter in. And there's that sense of like uh, like a Near Eastern temple that there's these kind of Lama or guardian figures. And then you wrap around and then finally you come in, as we talked about, like a little bit of this kind of holy of holies experience where, and then you sort of pull back the veil. So I'm kind of going to use that selfishly, um, co-opt his painting um, to mean what I want it to, which is to say that we'll do a sort of unveiling of you today. Wow. We'll leave some things, but we'll, we'll unveil some things and and I wanted to start, um, if anyone, could you raise your hands if you have already heard Devin speak before? Okay, so it's a kind of a mix. So I'd like to hear, um, I think it'd be really useful, but also just interesting to hear about your journey as an artist, but you can't say this about all artists, your, your artistic and your spiritual and philosophical journey, because uh, to me, these things seem like impossible to disentangle for you. Yeah. So I wonder, so it's kind of like build your own or choose your own adventure. Do you want to start with, with your, your sort of spiritual searching or your artistic searching? What would be I most? I think it kind of ties into a, just an overall background. And yeah. first of all, I will say thank you so much for coming today. I'm trying to get my heart beat down just a little bit more, so I apologize in advance for any nervousness on an S aspect. But, um, you know, my background started in, uh, I grew up in Portland, Oregon, and I started doing men's fashion when I was 15 with my brother, we were making t-shirts. So you were doing things. men's fashion when you were a boy though, right? Or were you doing men? <laughs> when I was a boy, well, I was, yeah, a see, boy, I was playing 15, baseball. You're already yeah. like, it's amazing to me that you are also so like entrepreneurial at yeah. 15. I like the yeah. idea that I was doing something that could actually be named in public at 15 would be astonishing. Okay, yeah, so you I were, mean, I, yeah. I was always like, when I was a young boy, I was, um, you know, I loved sports and I loved competition and I loved competing. And it was a big kind of aspect of my early life and I have, a mother and father that encouraged me to do anything and anything I can and they would support it and I think that was a huge driving force behind you know early early entrepreneurship stuff I remember when I was six and a half years old I made business cards on like the early programs of uh, I'll wash your car for five dollars because I saw something on someone else's door that said they'll wash your car for ten dollars so I went around and was washing the neighborhood cars for five dollars and I was like I'm starting a business and I was like eight years six, don't do that years. with your art by the way no, 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 no. <laughs> but it, it definitely um I think early on I had this idea that I was really wanted to excel in anything that I, I put my mind to and my parents encouraged that and when I got into middle school, high school, I found I had a teacher named Mr. Pagoda and I hope he'll see this one day because I've never get to go back and tell him this but he taught me Photoshop in one of my classes and mm. on Photoshop there was this ability to kind of make graphics and we'd present them to the class and I would do all these photo collages of really interesting objects and I was like, hey, can I print this on a t-shirt? And I remember that everyone had those malls in America you go to, and it was like for $10 you could print whatever graphic, and then you could you know, wear it the next day of school. So I would print the graphic, put it on, and I'd wear it to school and see what people would say. And if they liked it, they'd be like, I can get you one of these, no problem. It's going to be 20 bucks. Print it for $10, <laughs> and that slowly developed into kind of starting my first T-shirt business with my brother uh, when I was 15. By the time I left high school and started in college, we were selling like these T-shirts kind of in boutiques all around the world. Uh, we were in 50 states, 16 countries, and I was like, oh, I'm going to be a menswear designer. This is so cool. Like, I love fashion. Woohoo! And I had the harsh reality that fashion was one of the most difficult things to do, um, mm. which was I started trying to create luxury garments on a high level and really try to progress it. And I moved down to California and was like, okay, I'm going to get all these sewers. I'm going to produce these really quality garments, and I'm going to sell them all over the world. I'm going to do exactly what I did with T-shirts. I spent all my money trying to make these really nice garments and nothing sold. So I went right back to zero of like, now I'm in Los Angeles, I can't afford anything, I have about $500 to my name, 
hey, mom and dad, I think I might need to come home. And I, this is, this will loop back to answering your question, I promise, <laughs> but um, I was sitting in my friend's apartment that I was now bumming on his couch and I got a phone call from, well not a phone call, I got a direct message. I had about 1,500 followers on Instagram and a man said, hey, can I pay you 100 bucks to talk to you for 10 minutes? And I was like, well, this is really interesting. I hope this doesn't turn into the next crime investigation journal. Yeah. And um, I was like, you know what, 100 bucks, that'll buy me groceries, like let's do this. So I got on the phone call with him and um, he asked me, he's like, hey man, are you into religion? Are you spiritual? And I go, oh God, here we go again. This is gonna be a really interesting conversation. Him not knowing that during the process of building the fashion stuff, I had studied four and a half years in University of World Religion. I was really interested with the, the worldviews and perspectives that were out there. I had done this deep, immersive kind of self-reflection search for who is God and what is God and how can we tap into God and all different, you know, kind of values and perspectives of what they, and so, this guy says, are you really, uh, it's a really loaded question, but like, tell me what you're thinking. He goes, I don't know, man. I felt like I was talking with, uh, you know, I was praying for you, or I was, I don't know what you want to say, but I just really think you're supposed to start painting. And I was like, oh, that's interesting, man. Thanks for the hundred bucks. And I like hung up the phone. And there was something about that kind of tone of voice that he said, I think you should start painting. And I was like, okay, this could be really interesting. Hmm. You know, six months after that phone call, I had like picked up my first canvas and I was drawing on my friend's table. And then, um, I posted a little something on Instagram. People were like, this is really cool. And I was like, okay, thanks, man. And then a couple months later, I had made a very primitive early kind of resemblance of the figures you see now. And um, a friend of mine bought the first piece and I didn't really know him that well at the time. And then his parents saw the piece as well and they, they purchased the piece. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I think I'm an artist. Like people are buying these works. And it just happens mm. to be kind of one of those divine moments of saying, someone saying, hey, I think that you're supposed to start doing this. And it really spitballed the early kind of introduction into art um, from just outside encouragement to begin painting. So, you know, it's interesting because when you told that story, um, the sort of the, the sort of spiritual side was actually kind of this undercurrent. And you yeah. said, oh, kind of like as an aside, oh, by the way, you know, I was tied in. And actually, you've really quite deeply engaged with theology. So mm -hmm. like, I want to yeah, yeah. make that clear to everyone. So. Um, but actually, I think what's interesting there is that you had this tremendous um, receptivity. So of course you were broke, which also incentivizes someone to pick yeah. up the phone, right? <laughs> um, um, but, and I'm really happy that you're sitting here as opposed to like some OnlyFans site right now, because yes. I, could, I could see like two diverging paths yes, that this is. could have taken. Um, um, but that you, you had that openness. Why, why is it that you, that you felt like that language worked for you when he said, I think, because I mean, it's a weird thing to someone say, we don't live, I mean, you know, in centuries past, if someone had a dream or they wanted to express something, I mean, that would be taken very seriously that you would say to someone, you know, I have this conviction that you have this calling. And yeah. in fact, it'd be like a lot of the stories, the hagiography of saints begins that way, you know, like, yeah. um, but, but why do you think you were open to that suggestion and what happened between that moment when you heard that and then decided to pick up a paintbrush? I think during the time that I was studying, um, you know, world religion in school, I had immersed myself in different cultures. Like I spent about two and a half months in Israel, kind of going through that whole understanding of the conglomerates of every major worldview coming together in the center aspect and, and really getting to spend time and hear stories from individuals that talk about, I don't want to call it like a divine moment because it seems yeah. so arrogant in a sense, sure. but these yeah. moments of like receiving something from someone else and being willing to respond. And then even I spent time in Haiti and, and, and seeing on a complete flip side, um, you know, voodoo and magic being taking place and seeing how many people have been affected and can make things happen with these kind of weird potions and solutions and it's like very terrifying but at the same time you hear these stories of you know people doing ceremonial things over you know trees and the next day you wake up and the tree is dead and nothing else is dead around it and it's like well why did these things happen so I think I've always had this kind of yearning and this um, I guess excitement about these stories that are filled mm. with these moments of people saying hey stop for a second I want to tell you something and being willing to then be like, okay, maybe I should explore it rather than rejecting what may seem crazy on the street. Yeah. Do you think um, that, that sense of being arrested by someone's gaze or the thing that they say to you, mm -hmm. do you see an echo of that in your work? Because I mean, especially in this series, these are portraits. They, 
Um, they're also, they're um, a little bit larger than life size, depending on what kind of gigantism one does or doesn't have. But, um, and, but they're, they're looking at us eye to eye, yeah. and there's a sort of a form of address. Um, do you hope that the works speak to people? I mean, people say this in a very empty way, right? Oh, I want this to resonate or speak with you, but they don't always say it in a sense of like, that there's a form of, well, in a, a philosophical sense, a dialogic uh, address, yeah. like that, this, that an object says you to someone and looks at you in some way. Do you see the works as, as accomplishing that in some way? Yeah, I think I try to uh, push for a confrontational aspect to the work. I mean, the four front shapes that you'll always mostly see on the work are the central points, which are the eyes. And the eyes are actually the only shapes within the paintings that will never be altered in color. They always remain white or a shade of white, like a cream. And for me, it's that idea of like that purity of receiving something from someone else and, and moving towards it. It's not like rejecting like, hey, this person may be crazy mm -hmm. and kind of letting your eyes twist and turn and your mind spin, but rather keeping this kind of purity and divinity to the confrontational aspect of the eyes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in some of the other paintings that you'll see throughout the series of works that I do, it's either two figures looking in at each other or having this moment of confrontation or the singular figure having a confrontation with the viewer itself. You know, it's interesting. You hadn't mentioned that before, um, the, that unchanging nature of the eye, yeah. that sort of impassivity. And now when I look at the eye forms, yeah, first of all, they seem to be of a, um, of a lighter shade. Um, uh, they're not lidded. They don't have eyelashes, right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing else. So they're, um, but I, I guess I'm also sort of thinking about still whether they are open or not open or whether they sort of, or whether they're fully lidded or hooded or something, do they, do they see in a way without being, being seen to see? Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of interesting dimension there. I think of the biblical language of scales falling from the eyes yeah. and as a sort of a form of revelation. So here, I, are, am I looking at eyes from which the scales have fallen or are yet to fall or do our eye, the scales fall from our eyes and looking at them? What do you um, think? I think, it's, I think it's a mixture of interpretation of how yeah. a viewer wants to come about it. For me, I mean, I don't deliberately think about that specifically. For, I guess, my understanding of it is that the eyes are always the central format to understanding. And uh, you see yeah. and you receive through your eyes, but you can also tell through your eyes. And yeah. so I think there is like a really great connection of being able to face off between someone one on one and have that experience of being able to kind of like we talked about earlier, surrendering to something yeah. and being open through that surrender. Yeah, there's something, I mean, you know, it's interesting because in a way they could be arrayed here and they could be arrayed in judgment, right? You could have like a divine court of heavenly, and this is how the book of Job starts, for yeah. instance, right? Um, a really perverse court that's assembled, right? So you could have a bunch of different figures assembled, but there is, a, I mean, we talked about this a little bit earlier, that there's a kind of tranquility that mm -hmm. comes from them. And so here we have, I think hopefully just two cameras, but yeah. <laughs> um, so we have cameras and here we have a literally an unblinking, two unblinking eyes zeroing in and looking at us. But how, but it strikes me how different the camera eye is from the eyes of your work, yeah. um, that they're both are open and stuff, but that there's something profoundly non-judgmental yeah. about the eyes in your work. Yeah, and we, and we talked about it a little bit as well, as just the idea of, um, you know, the Guardian series, I, I, I mean, maybe I can dive into it, it gives a yeah. little more background. It's it. just, uh, the figure themselves, I kind of coined this term as they are called Guardians, and it was based off of the studies of the world religion and, and different perspectives and worldviews that I was doing in university. And for me, so much of the differences um, were discussed in the coursework. Hey, here's the difference between what you believe, here's the difference between what you believe and you believe and you believe, and here, let's create more division by just singling out little things to talk about that, yeah, we all know that these different faiths and different worldviews are completely separate, but what's the common thread between all these? Because we can see over and over in the course of history, the more we create separation through ideologies and, and worldviews, yeah. there just tends to become more turmoil, more pain, more war, more suffering. And so when I was writing this final paper, I said, okay, hey, what's the one singular thread between all of these, these major worldviews? And for me, it was this idea that agnostic, atheist, Christian, Catholic, Buddhist, Hindu, whatever, you name it, there was some sort of desire to have a spiritual protector or someone that was mm. supposed to meant to guide you through this world. It could be an animal, it could be a human, it could be a deity, but there is this kind of need or want or desire to have something guide you and help you in this journey of life. And for some people, it's the journey into whatever that afterlife is. Yeah. And so the figures themselves are supposed to be this non-theological symbol of protection, regardless of what you believe. And there is this kind of 
idea that, hey, if this is placed in a home or a household, you can assimilate your belief system to it and feel that it's a protector watching over. And we mm. have these different ideas of what that means in one's life. And I'm not here to be on a podium and preach and tell you what it is or what it isn't, but it's left to be open for interpretation. Mm. Well, I think, you know, one of the things I find really refreshing is that you're you're willing to, t and I think part of it is generational, not to make myself seem really old, I don't, <laughs> but um, I think some of it is a generational in the sense that people are willing to talk about uh, spirituality and their mm -hmm. practice in a way now, and I think perhaps also it's, um, it's geographical as well as generational, yeah. that it's Californian, <laughs> um, yeah. that they're in West Coast, that there is an, there's an openness, whereas, you know, we're, we're here in New York City, and I mean, I look at the artists of the 50s and um, 60s, you know, Barnett Newman was asked to be on a panel at the Jewish Museum, said yes, talked about his work, and then wrote them a letter complaining afterwards to say that they turned him into a Jewish artist. And you're like, dude, you said yes to do this thing at the Jewish yeah. Museum. So there was a terror, there were, they were afraid of how limiting it would be um, to even talk in a spiritual register. Yeah. And so they would talk only in the most sort of loose, as Rothko did, of like, um, sort of mythological language. So the Holocaust yeah. was happening, but they were like, let's stick with the mythology and the, the tragedy, trauma, like just these, you know, capitalized large terms. And I, what I love is your sort of openness to go really specifically into different traditions, but also then not only to do that, but to draw comparisons, because I think yeah. our cultural vocabulary at the moment is one where we're so reticent to say, this reminds me of this because, of the, oh, is that cultural appropriation? Are we, yeah. are we reducing the uniqueness of any given culture? But yeah. you're able to sort of draw from these different wellsprings. I wonder if you, um, we've talked about some of them, but I think it'd be interesting for folks here. Do you want to say like a little bit um, of some of the kind of possible references? Not to be yeah. deterministic about it, but some of, the, some of these w forms of protectors in different cultural, artistic yeah. traditions. Yeah, I know we talked about the sentinels, or in the, I always butcher the actual terminology for it, so I stay away from it because I don't want to get roasted too bad. <laughs> but it's those uh, rock structures of stacked stones, and they, you see them a lot in Arctic kind of yeah. indigenous tribes. And a lot of my work deals with shape stacking and using light sources to kind of draw out the highs and lows. And when I was researching <laughs> these sentinels, it's this beautiful thing that there was this cross comparison of these indigenous people use them as navigational tools. So a lot of times we see them as, oh, it's this meditative process of stacking stones. But in the, you know, back in the day, they would use them to actually navigate their people from one location to the other. And you knew you were on the right path if you found these structures. And so for me, with this idea of having this guiding force that's then in this kind of more prominent figure, there's a lot of parallels between yeah. a lot of this indigenous. And even if you look at pre-Arabian deities, when they were trying to describe you know, what it is that is out there, or what is this kind of spiritual benevolence that's above us, they use just singular shapes to kind of stack and create these abstracted forms because there was no like literal reference of what these things may or may not look like. Yeah. So when I came to the painting practice, I said, okay, I think I need to use shapes to really tell this story. And yeah, they might seem simple and it might seem like still life, you know, abstracted in certain ways to create, you know, a, a, a figurative variation of it. But there is so much more in the aspect of shapes and even the idea that shapes create the entire universe that we live in, everything down to the benches you sit on, the chairs that we're in, the building that we're in, everything is made up of shapes. And so I think there is this kind of spiritual injection that comes from just the idea of form. Mm. Yeah, and I think there's that, that sort of sense of, yeah, I mean, I really love how you're talking about that, these kind of rudimentary objects, and also that that was your way into painting, yeah. was essentially to gather stones. You know, I actually am kind of reminded of, I think you've set me in the mo moment of thinking about some of these kind of scripture allusions, but it's time to gather stones, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, but that, but that, 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 that outset of that creative act for you was saying, like, what are the fundamental things that I know are true? Yeah. Actually, Cezanne talked about this a little bit of cones and rot, different things, but, but of finding the fundamental shapes and then beginning to put those together. And I think, you know, apropos your, this kind of sense of control and surrender, that, there, that it's hard to unpick what was intended and what was intended by the medium itself. Yeah. So as you were finding, the, as you're finding shapes, which is to say you were creating shapes, mm -hmm. um, you are also finding this sort of ineluctable like force sort of combining them and drawing yeah. them together and sort of wanting to create something human. And that's yeah. something, again, that we see sort of cross-culturally is this, this desire, I mean, we see in those Indukshuk, um, uh, Inuit, um, uh, 
a cairns of that it, that it didn't take long for it, for something to develop that was like an arm like structure, right? Yeah. And as humans, we just and there's even theories of religion that um, that say I don't know if this is entirely true, but it's one theory that people um, that that we have an evolutionary predisposition to find human forms. So when we go yeah. looking for the gods, it's that we are, we are actually pre-formatted um, for whether it's for threats on the horizon or something, yeah. that we see a shadow and we see it to be a person, but yeah. we, we perceive presence. And so I love this sort of sense, the depth of presence that you're able to bring out um, mm -hmm. in these forms. Thank you. Yeah, and it's funny because it's like I always keep consistent. There's like this like semicircle mouth structure and two eyes, and that's all you really need to create like a, some sort of humanistic approach right. to everything else. But anything else in the entire thing is completely abstract with this, the stacking of the shapes. But we still a lot of time people are like, are these humans? Are these humans? I'm like, well, it could be. You know, it doesn't have to be. But because you put two dots in a little mouth, it makes a human all of a sudden. And not to tease or, or prematurely drop things that, that you might be working on in the future, but it sounded to me like, like you're, you feel like being pulled to animate more forms. And I know you're also exploring ideas of, of dual portraiture yeah. and what that sort of dialogue is. So I love that, you know, it was really nice you said to me earlier that, um, that you like to leave something that sort of beckons the next series of works. Yeah. And that you ha and it seems like you're doing that in a couple of different ways, but with the, with the two figures and then a sort of a levitating third presence there, or something beyond, something untethered to the ground, something just as stony and solid and heavy, yeah. and, yet, um, and, and yet blissfully able to, um, to remain aloft, um, that you're thinking also of the kind of mystery that happens, what is it when you sort of go into society? Yeah. So in a sense, like I, I, would, I would sort of argue that you know, what you've assembled here are all of these different um, p forms, these totemic forms, mm -hmm. but they're all, the future seems to be bringing them into conversation. Yeah. Um, I think there's a, a beautiful image, uh, Magdalena Abikanovitz, um, that her sculpture, she's talked about them as like these kind of headless um, metal forms that she's left them all over the world, but there'll be this kind of in-gathering. Yeah. Like, uh, that, and she likes to imagine that them all sort of being in communion in some way. Mm -hmm. And I sort of see that a bit in your work yeah. of like there, you've, you're populating the world with these figures and you're sending them off and saying, you know, protect this place, do this thing, protect yeah. this home that they will come to dwell in or this museum. Um, but they're also, they're also interconnected and it seems like you're bringing things, yeah. you're in, that dialogue is becoming a bigger part of what you're doing. And I also feel like the, the, the portrait or the, the guardian, whatever you want to call them as they are, uh, it's also supposed to be a reflection of like you as yourself. And I feel like I don't want people to confuse the aspect of like, hey, these guardian figures are just telling stories in every show, but actually it, it can now also be a human form or be myself or be you yeah. in the painting. And what is those kind of opposing things that we need to face? So a lot of like even hinting at next show is this, this kind of progression of moving into oneself and moving through those certain, certain aspects of one's life that we haven't identified. So a lot of the figure structures now are coming together and there's multiple figures and there's groups and there's certain aspects that can be either informed by just the figure themselves or as a person being yourself inside of the paintings. So we, um, we talked about this as, you know, the um, control and surrender as a kind yeah. of motif. Um, yeah. And at the start, you, um, you know, we were uh, talking about what it means to sort of recognize one's own calling from someone else mentioning it and being sort of receptive to that. So there's a sense of like surrender to a moment, but then executing the kind of control of deciding what you're going to do with that. Mm -hmm. when, you, um, when, you, when you're in the studio and you're painting, and I know that process, the way it looks has changed for you over time. Yeah. You said it was really solitary to yeah. begin with. Um, what kind of, uh, people talk, um, about presence in the studio in all sorts of different ways. Yeah. Um, uh, I think it was Philip Gustin who said, you know, when I start, it's like there's everyone is in the studio, including all the old masters, and they're looking at me and they're judgmental. Yeah. And then eventually they all leave and it's me painting. And then if I'm lucky, I leave. Yeah. And then I'm painting, right? That, um, and what kind, of, what kind of presence do you feel in this studio? Like what in terms of, is there something that you feel you're, you might sort of be surrendering to in some way? Yeah, I think it's a constant battle in the studio of like the difference between control and surrender and that just those two words in general can cross so many different planes. But I, I feel like so much of the, 
world I live in and so much of my, my life and my past was about c controlling every aspect of it. I want to control the outcome of every situation. I want to be almost a godlike figure myself so I have you know, security and a sense of understanding as I move through this journey in life. And I feel like bringing control into a studio is such an kind of an abstract word yeah. to use because yes, yeah. so much of the process you do control by painting and mixing the paints and having your maquettes and you do your lighting and you have it all planned out. But the moment you start painting, you have to surrender to the fact that it's probably never gonna go as you intend. And yeah. when you have that moment of surrender, you have this understanding that like, wow, this painting can be a more life driven than you could ever imagine. And it mm. translates so much more. It's like this, this kind of, I don't wanna say meditative, but therapy, like therapist moment of being able to understand more about yourself as you paint. Because even if you look in the past, it's like, we had very little control of any of our outcomes. Like yeah. ancient days, like the elements, sickness, weather, whatever it may be, controlled every aspect of it. And those people had to surrender to the fact that they couldn't. That's why they looked elsewhere. And now with technology and everything we have, we want to control even more and more again, but that's leading to more and more problems. Or the, and, yeah, the facsimile of control, right? Yeah. yeah, I think that was what was so like yeah. um, philosophically disruptive for people about um, COVID even um, uh, alongside the sheer um, trauma of what happened to people, yeah. but was the, the fact that they couldn't influence outcomes, yeah. that there was just no... Exactly, and you can no. find comfort in surrendering. I feel like I just have to surrender more and more every single day to every aspect of it, and I, the, the paintings themselves, I think it's like the funny stories of like art critics walking in to like go look at a piece, and they kind of come in all da-da-da, and they look at it, and they're like, mm, and then they finally kind of watch them break down, and they sit mm. there for a moment, and you're like, oh, now you've actually had the moment with it, but it took them a while to get out from all the control and all the narrative they've already had to now look at something and surrender to the fact that, like, okay, maybe there is something interesting here. And we talked about it even, you know, with Brian Ennio, what he talks about with like ancient shit making. And it's like this idea of, you know, people that know anything about shit making in the past was that the best boats were the ones that were constantly getting repaired because they were kind of this flexible wood that would constantly leak and they would need to caulk it and keep going back to it. And then they were like, hey, we need to make better boats. We're gonna do this really firm wood. It's gonna be really sharp. We're gonna put it out on the water. And the moment they put it on the water, it started to splinter and rip and they couldn't do anything with it because they took the flex out of the boat. So this idea of kind of the metaphor between the two of old shit making being something that we kind of need to surrender to the currents and the waves and it's okay if it starts leaking and gets a little damaged, it will get repaired. It's actually much better than a boat completely snapping in half because you're trying to control the ocean, which is impossible to control. Yeah, and I think you're, you know, what's interesting is that there's that sophistication and awareness in your work and in the way you're talking that, um, that in a sense, you're, uh, you know, it'd be easy to map onto your work a sense that, um, that we live in unstable times and we need something rocky and we need some sort of ballast and we need something, we need something of totemic power yeah. to, to, to fall back on. But what you're saying is that there's actually this kind of, pliability and flexibility yeah. and your own work is an adaptive process yeah. um, and one of the things you know we were speaking about is that I think there's a tendency to people for people to assume especially as art writers that the final product um, is an accurate reflection of the way something came into being and so when you look at a Jackson Pollock we know that he stomped around and he splashed a lot of paint and was uh, drunk for at least 57 percent of the time but there's a um, but there but the but the outcome in action painting is so is so strongly tied to the circumstances of origin. Yeah. And what's interesting is the way you've set up your artistic process, as I understand it, is that there's this flexibility and openness that's guiding you through the process. Yeah. And even though you create forms which are quite physically substantial and solid, mm -hmm. um, there's also a sense of indeterminacy about the future as well. Yeah. So there's a, so you're sort of, you're finding your way constantly through this sort of undercurrent of, of stability and instability. Yeah. And I think there's an honesty about that, that kind of process. I just think when you try to maintain a certain level of control, it will always fail over and over and over again. And being from not the most traditional artist background, having the flexibility of understanding like, hey, not that I don't know what I'm doing, but I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. But I do know what I'm doing, but I don't know what I'm doing. Keeping that has allowed so much innovation and allowing to understand like my own work more and more. And I think that ability to surprise yourself, I yeah. think that's the other thing is, right, is that yeah. how to remain, like what is the, what is the, the right amount of um, restlessness exactly. in one's work. Yeah. And I think, you know, what's interesting to me, and, and we'll keep an eye out on when we should what, how we should go with time, and you tell us. Um, but there's, um, 
you know, one of the things that I think your, your background allows for is that you are able to find a, a freshness in actually going back to some of the old masters. Yeah. And so actually, like, there's nothing of like, oh, I've already studied this, I've done this, and I repeated this, but actually, and so a lot of the works here are evocative of a close yeah. study of Goya, for instance, but of yeah. like going back to just fun, going looking for fundamental shapes yeah. within, within those traditions. Yeah, and like a lot of the show is inspired by many Dutch and Flemish masters, and uh, you know, the, the smaller works in this room specifically were kind of a recreation of you know, pretty one-to-one -one ideas that have come from those people, but the only thing that I was really interested in was when I was looking into who these people were that they, you know, these paintings were of, you're kind of like, you start to read stories about who they were as a person, you're like, these people failed people over and over and over again, and we put these trust in these human figures to really like help us and lead the nation and do all this stuff, and it's like, okay, maybe we should replace this iconography. Not that it needs to be replaced completely, but if we're gonna talk about a society where we wanna create unity and growth, some of those images carry a lot of weight. Yeah, and I think it's just, you know, how it, I mean, I think one of the things that's really interesting is you're creating totems, you're creating receptacles for us to put our faith in or to examine our faith, but you're not creating idols. Yeah. And those are very, various, those are yeah. very different things. And so, so um, yeah, it, it, it's stable, it's resonant, it's powerful, but it's not, but it's never, something is never all powerful. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so, they, so that humility sort of pleasantly undercuts and erodes yeah. any other impulse. I yeah. always say it's like the work is not to, like I said a little bit earlier, it's not on a pedestal to say what is right and what is wrong. It's simply to create like a safe space for conversations where we can have a third party object. You can speak about what you see in it or what you believe. I'm able to speak about what I see and what I believe. And because it's a third party object, it doesn't create this tension right between us. Well, I think there's um, they're speaking, but there's also silence, and yeah. I think that's really the, the beauty of, of sitting in a room surrounded by these kind of works, yeah. is that we feel like they're all speaking to us and they're addressing us, but they're but they're doing it in a way that's just to me slightly pre-linguistic. Yeah. They're speaking, they're reaching out, but we're not exactly sure what they say, and then you you leave for that moment of the thank God for writers like me to then, to then write something about that. Um, well, um, thank, thank you so much for yeah, this conversation. It's just so great to Appreciate be able to sit with an artist like yourself and just talk so openly about the things that influence you and where you're going. So it's really I fun. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank Doctor. You.